Hemlock Knots. Cracking the restoration's toughest subjects through rational, balanced analysis of source material. Tonight's topic, the origins of LDS polygamy, the missionary journals of Samuel Smith and Orson Hyde among the Cochranites. So here we have an example of trying to find sources that are like first hand sources and really good, credible things that we can examine versus sources that might not be so credible, which we're going to take a look at throughout this episode. But these are missionary journals of, of, of Sam and Orson that we can read and compare because they wrote their entries individually. So we kind of have this cross um, examination thing where, well, he said this, what did he say? Oh, he basically said similar things. And as we go through that tonight, we're going to discover the earliest firsthand account of this notion of polygamy and also uh, called spiritual wifery among among these uh, Crocodonite peoples. That's right. And so this is a hot topic because, you know, gospel topics, essays here and there, certain, uh, you know, materials published by the LDS Church will state that, you know, Joseph was aware of polygamy as early as 1813. Now, the sources on that are pretty dodgy, but, um, and we'll get into one of those sources where that comes from in just a minute. But You've also got the idea, well, where did it originate? Was it Fanny Alger? Was it, you know, uh, the 1838 stuff? Was, you know, was it in, in Nauvoo? Well, no, we're going to go all the way back to 1832 and talk about the first instance of credible sources in the LDS history archives that talk about the idea of spiritual wifery and plural marriage being introduced into um, the people that the, the LDS missionaries were intermingling with. So go ahead and bring up the first slide there, Dustin. Let's get that going here. And uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give you a real quick, maybe three or four minute overview of what the Cochranites were. Who were they? What did they believe? What were their practices? It's important for us to get this clear and understood before we jump into their journals, because they're going to be making a lot of references to practices and beliefs. And it's just good to get an overall, you know, um, crash course in what they believe. So Jacob Cochran was a man that lived in the early 1800s up in New England. He was from New Hampshire originally. He had moved to, to Maine, Saco, Maine area. And he had a large congregation of thousands of people that, that believed in some of these teachings. They were called the Cochranites. And so here's a description of the Cochranite practices really quick. And this is uh, coming from a guy named Ephraim Stinchfield in the book Cochranism Delineated. And so I'll just... I'll paraphrase a few of the things that he said, right? And he's talking about how he went in February of 1817. There was a stranger in the land that somebody told him about named Jacob Cochran, who called himself a preacher. He said, I heard no more from this stranger until the summer following, 1818, when until the summer following when a report was in circulation that large numbers, some said more than 1,000 had been converted unto his ministry. Right. And we've got popular stuff. Yeah. He had over a thousand. This is not just a little small congregation on the corner, but, you know, I'm going to be showing you for the next couple of slides, this map here of New England. Um, and you can see that, you know, I'm pointing to some of these cities there, uh, a place called Kinnebunk, uh, Scarborough, Saco, York, um, Portland, Maine. Th this is the hot spot and the trail that led up to the New England where, you know, a lot of these colonies were. And so, um, so anyway, this guy, Ephraim Stinchfield, go to the next slide. I'll read a few more things. They had private, sometimes dark meetings in which none but such as were bound by oath to the most involuble secrecy, not to divulge what was transacted in the meeting upon penalty of eternal damnation or having their names blotted out of the book of life. That sounds really familiar to me, by the way. They had oaths and covenants of secrecy, right? Um, penalty oaths, even. And he says that each brother and sister in this fraternity had a spiritual husband, wife, mate, or yoke fellow, such as they chose or their leaders chose for them. These spiritual mates dissolve or disannul all former marriage connections. So these spiritual wife and spiritual husband relationships were meant to make null and void all of the civil marriages that were already in place, right? 
And so he even goes on to say that, you know, and many of them bed and board together to the exclusion of all former vows. So you've got, uh, you know, these are, these spiritual wife, you know, systems were replacing traditional marriages. The exclusion of all former vows meaning like, oh, I'm married, but that's cool. We're going to, we're going to lie in bed together tonight because uh, you're my spiritual wife. So it doesn't matter that I have another wife. Yeah, it doesn't matter. All right, go to the next slide for me. I'll just hit a few more highlights before we dive in. Okay, we're going to say a little bit more about these guys. Now, continuing on the quote from uh, Ephraim Stinchfield, but they pretended to have seven women to one man in the society, alluding, as they told me, to a prophecy, prophecy in Isaiah, on that day shall seven men take hold of one man, right? Yeah, the seven women, that also sounding really familiar. <laughs> That's in, uh, yeah, it's in Isaiah. Misquoted all the time. And in the book of Mark. Meaning Cochran's dwelling house, his dwelling house in Saco is on the road leading from Saco Falls to Buxton Corner. The general family consists of 12 females besides those who visit the house occasionally, right? Some of these are widows who with the rest of the females have surrendered their persons, character, and property into the common stock. These people had even a form of, you'd say, consecration or sharing all things in common. You know, there was communal property here. Um, including people, uh, sexual partners. Um, and so he went on to say, you know, he tells of more than 2,000 people now under him. So as the years go by, between 1,000 and 2,000 people were up in these tiny, tiny coastal villages of Maine. And so that's the, the context to our story as we begin. I think there's one more slide for a few more points. There it talks about one man who was admitted, a member of Cochrane's fraternity. He had to hold a Bible in his hand while Cochrane administered a solemn oath, or what was called so, right? Then he pointed to and named this young man's spiritual wife and said he was willing that they should lodge together, which they did a number of nights. So here you have the, the basic you know, it's only one description of many. The Wikipedia article talks a little about their beliefs too, but this is one man's opinion of, of what their beliefs were having spent a lot of time among them. And we don't want to dwell too much on their teachings per se, but we do need to lay the foundation for this, knowing that um, these are the people that Samuel Smith and Orson Hyde are going to go visit. Right. And I also want to point out a thing that you brought to my attention here was that despite however strange that spiritual wife system might have been, um, at the end of the day, they were looking to this idea of polygamy uh, as sanctioned by the Bible, which I think Mormon factions should be able to sympathize with. And then also the fact that they clearly had goodwill uh, with having things in common with each other, that takes quite a bit of goodwill to be able to live in that type of system. Absolutely. And you'll find through these missionary journals in just a minute that these Cochranite people were actually really, really nice people. They opened their homes. They let missionaries stay with them. They fed them. They gave them money. They, you know, they let them sleep in their homes and, and all kinds of stuff. So they were very hospitable people, very open doored, very open community. And so it's easy to see why missionaries, after lots of rejection, perhaps would be would be drawn to these types of homes because these right. people really, really were community community based and perhaps open in other ways too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. um, let's let's keep it moving. Now we want to talk about the earliest origins of LDS polygamy. Remember, we were talking. That's the name of the show. So there's dispute about this. Some people will say no, the Cochranites were not responsible for this. Now they weren't responsible themselves, but their traditions and their beliefs got integrated into the church. But let's give you some some context as to what's happening. Dustin, what is the Lord saying about marriage in 1831? Well, so our section in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 42, uh, so this happened in early 1831, which is well before these uh, missionary travels happened, you know, which was about mid to end of the year. Thou shalt love thy wife, singular, with all thy heart, and shalt cleave unto her, singular, and none else. And he that looketh upon a woman to lust after her shall deny the faith, etc., etc. Right? And then just a few months later, here's another statement from section 49. 
So this is just a few months later. Marriage is ordained of God unto man. Wherefore, it is lawful that he should have one wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. And all this that the earth might answer the end of its creation. What does the word twain mean? And they twain the two. Two. It means two. Uh, and there's really no other way to really interpret um, the 1831 law of God that was given through Revelation. So Joseph Smith was revealing to the saints that this was the law of God a year before, you know, Samuel and, and uh, Orson were out, you know, preaching among these people. It was well known. Monogamy was the law of the church, for sure. Okay, keep moving. So, you know, but we have to address this other source, okay? So many people will say, ah, yes, but um, William W. Phelps, W.W. W. Phelps, wrote a letter to Brigham Young stating that in July 17th, 1831, right, He's written this letter 30 years later. He's recollecting, you know, in 1861, he's talking about what happened in 1831, July, stating, stating a particular day, Joseph Smith received a published publication declaring that some missionaries were to marry Native American women. Okay, so and then Phelps is going to quote some of this, right, from his letter. Phelps remembered 30 years later, quote, about three years after this was given, I asked Brother Joseph privately hmm, how we that were mentioned in the Revelation could take wives from the natives as we were all married men. He replied instantly. Now he goes into dialogue verbatim here. So he remembers this exact quote for the next two sentences 30 years later. Joseph Smith, he was saying, he replied instantly, quote, in the same manner that Abraham took Hagar and Keturah, and Jacob took Rachel, Bilhah, and Zilpah. By revelation, the saints of the Lord are always directed by revelation. Well, that last sentence sounds good. It does. And there's nothing wrong with revelation, for sure. However, you know, let's take a look at the, the quality of this source. Because we have to compare, okay, is this the earliest credible source? This thing we're looking at right now? If so, God help us, okay? Because we've got two firsthand contemporary journals written by two different missionaries, right? And I, we have to take, you know, which one's more credible? Which one's more accurate as far as, you know, um, this law of marriage and how these things you know, came about in the church? So this is a 30-year recollection. It's a mixed firsthand and secondhand account, and it's got 47% of these quotes. He's quoting Joseph Smith with dialogue verbatim, which we know has some, some limitations as far as the human mind's capabilities. Yeah, uh, and why don't you address what we talked about here about the Keturah issue? Sure. You have bracketed false. Yeah, so I added false there because, you know, according to the Bible in Genesis, it, it says that Abraham married Keturah, but this was after Sarah had died. And so that doesn't really count as a, you know, a, a polygamous relationship. And so he's saying that, you know, we are supposed to marry these Lamanite women in the same way that Hagar and Keturah were married. Well, they were married in totally different manners. Keturah was a legal wife under God's law who was married to Abraham after Sariah had died. So that's important to point out. I guess and W.W. W. Phelps didn't really know that story of the Bible too well. <laughs> Perhaps not. <laughs> or whoever wrote, or whoever wrote this letter. I'm not an Old Testament uh, expert either, but you know that that's what the story says is that is that was that was not a polygamous wife um, for Abraham. Okay, so now you know with that context, God has revealed several times in the Doctrine and Covenants through Joseph Smith that law, folks. Um, and in 1832 in February, now we have the point where Samuel Smith and Orson Hyde are sent on a mission to the Eastern countries, and this includes Maine, um, New York, New Hampshire, right? And, and they begin documenting in both of their journals. Like we said, these are, these are collaborative witnesses, the law of two witnesses. A lot of these events, are they collaborate perfectly well. Um, obviously, they were in the same spot as companions. And so they start to meet with some Cochranite members of the congregation. So a lot of people wonder, well, where did these come from? Where did these journals exist? These are actually LDS, in the LDS Church Historians Archives up in Salt Lake City are the originals. And then you've got a couple of different typescript copies. One is from Dale R. Broadhurst Papers at the Marriott Library up at the University of Utah. Um, Cheryl Bean um, had a book called Rediscovering History. She's up in Idaho. That was in 1995. There's a typescript found in that book. And then also Richard and Pamela Price of the Restoration Bookstore, Joseph 
Bot Polygamy Volume 1, Chapter 3, you will find a pretty detailed TypeScript. And um, from all of these sources is where we're getting some of these excerpts that we're going to share with you next. All right, so if you're listening along on a podcast or you want to read these for yourself, go to hemlockknots.com slash Cochranites, and that will redirect you to all of the excerpts that we're going to be reading from Samuel Smith and Orson Hyde's journals. And we're going to start reading these, and I've asked Dustin to be Orson Hyde, and uh, I will do the voice of Samuel Smith. So we'll just say the date, and then we'll, we'll read it out of their, their journals like they said it. June 29. Preached in the evening, two ladies confessed their faith in the work, and a Miss Elizabeth and Mrs. Augusta Adams Cobb. Baptized three, Augusta Cobb, Elizabeth Herendine, and Anne Porter. This was in Boston, Massachusetts. July 1st. Attended the sacrament, considerably disturbed by false spirits in a man and woman that believed in the Cochranite doctrine. We cried against them, and after little, got them considerably quelled. Not a very good time because of disturbance. Now, before I move on, um, real quick, this is Mark Curtis again. <laughs> um, the blue that you're seeing on the screen highlight what the doctrines and the beliefs of the Cochranite people are, and the red highlights actually indicate them referring to Cochranites. So you so, can tell so. if they're Cochranite and, you know, by context of them being red, right? And then the, the ones that are highlighted in orange are actually figures in history that went on to become polygamists later on, right? So that's what the color codes mean. We should have told you that before, but... Uh, no, it's a good time to tell them now. Yep, <laughs> before we move on. So you finished Orson Hyde's for July 1st? Yep. Okay, we're on July 1st, 1832. Samuel Smith said, somewhat interrupted this day in the evening by a man and a woman that taught the doctrine of the devil, such as having spiritual wives. They came out to our meeting. The woman arose and began to preach, and we requested her to stop, and she would not. And we cried against her spirit, for we knew that it was an unclean spirit. And we cried against it that it was of the devil, and it made a considerable stir. The man, which is the night, that had the same spirit tempted us, saying, Cast the devil out, crying amen to the words of the woman. After considerable muttering and grumbling and shaking of her frame, she stopped and we proceeded with our meeting. So again, Boston, Massachusetts. Boston, yep. So now we're in York, Maine for September 25th. Samuel Smith said, a large congregation came together and Brother Orson preached to them. We've been, we've been were invited to go home with a young man by the name of Ledgkins and stayed overnight with him. His stepmother, Ledgkin's stepmother, we had seen before. We had seen her in Boston, the woman that came to, into our meeting and had cried, and we had cried against her spirit. There right? it is. So here we have the first instance of a dude named Ludgkins, whose stepmom was batch crazy before, <laughs> or the week before, up in Boston with, you know, possessed spirits. So this woman who was a Cochranite has a stepson who invites the missionaries to stay with them that night right exactly about all getting close to almost three months later yep a little over two and a half months later and he so it so it was very memorable two and a half months like ah, i remember i remember, <laughs> I remember that stepmother. lady she was crazy <laughs> <laughs> so right, orson hyde, Sep september 28th orson hyde attended a cochranite meeting and they said if anyone had a message from god there was liberty to give it unto the people. And that's pretty nice of them. Yeah. I commenced by prayer, but thought I would not tell them about the work then, but would get their confidence in the first place. Okay, Samuel Smith said, same day, September 28th. We went to a meeting in the evening, and the people were called Cochranites because the man that first preached their faith, talking about Jacob Cochran, his name was Cochran. They gave liberty for anyone to speak. Brother Orson spoke to them and exhorted them to faithfulness to the Lord and to humility and to stand in the counsel of the Lord, that they might know the voice of the good shepherd, that they might, when the voice came, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go out to meet him. And they said, Amen. When the meeting closed, we spake that we would like to preach to the people. They would not let us. And that happened in Kennebunkport, Maine. October 10th, a couple weeks later, Orson Hyde. 
visited three families, but without much hope of doing anything to profit them because of the Cochranites, a deluded sect of people by whom many had been deceived. Many, he see, he says many. And the people were afraid of the truth. And for this cause, the way of truth was evil spoken of, but few came out to meeting. Samuel Smith said on the same day, October 10th, a less number came together in the evening than before. But we declared unto them that they must repent and go up to Zion. That was also in Kennebunkport, Maine. October 11th, the next day. Orson Hyde preached to a congregation of Cochranites who gave liberty. There it is again, letting people preach. It's awesome. Told them again to repent and go up to Zion. And we lifted our cry in the spirit. And I hope some of them will go. But they had a wonderful, lustful spirit. And when he says wonderful, he means like incredibly lustful spirit. A wonderful, lustful spirit. Because they believe in a plurality of wives, which they call spiritual wives. Knowing them not after the flesh, but after the spirit. But by the appearance, they knew one another after the flesh. <laughs> so he's, he's saying, wait a minute. They are clearly knowing each other after the flesh. Meaning they're being intimate with each other. Um, Samuel Smith said the same day, October 11th. 1832, the people in these parts were under a delusion of such a spirit of confusion had seized, seized them that it appeared to be impossible to teach them, to get them to hear and understand by the right spirit. And that was from Ogakit, Maine, which was three miles north of Kennebunkport. So they're in the same general areas still. A few days later, October 15, Orson Hyde called on Mr. Goodrich and Stimson, tried to persuade them to go to Zion. There it is then again. And they seemed to have some little disposition to go, but could not bring them to repentance before God. Came up about two miles farther to Mr. Timothy Hams and tarried all night. Found him an enthusiastic man, a Cochranite. Not much hopes of going to Zion or embracing in Newburyport, Maine. Okay, October 16th, the next day, uh, we're, we're paraphrasing here, but the gist of their journal entries was that Orson Hyde and Samuel Smith spent the day at a man's house named Timothy Ham, and he was a Cochranite. They were helping him harvest potatoes and do a bunch of household chores all day. Then they held meetings in the evening with some of the Cochranites, and this happened in Newburyport, Maine. So the night of October 16th, they spend the entire day at Timothy Ham's. He's a Cochranite. They preach late into the evening that night at his house in Newburyport. October 17, Orson Hyde visited three families and talked a good deal. Some hopes of their going to Zion sometime. Samuel Smith said, same day, Brother Orson preached to them, spake upon the covenant, declaring unto them that they must repent, all of them, and be baptized and go to Zion. But they were hard and unbelieving, and we had not much hope for them. So interesting there, side note, doctrinally speaking, historically on the connection of covenant between repent and baptism. Uh, okay, Samuel continues next day. October 18th. Stayed at home of Captain Andrews. This man was a Cochranite. Stayed at the home of Captain Andrews, who had showed some interest and was a subscriber to the Evening in the Morning Star. Visited some of the neighborhood and found some that we thought would go to Zion. October 2021, 20, Orson Hyde tarried all night at Mr. McKinney's, a Cochranite, who lived with what he called a spiritual wife. Orson Hyde, three days later, October 24th, one man arose and said the people would not be likely to receive. Oh, that's you. Go ahead, Orson. Oh, I'm Orson Hyde. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> One man arose and said, the people would not be likely to receive it, the gospel, if it were true because of Cochrane's description. He did mention the names of two Cochranites and said, if we had any fellowship for them, he wished us to depart out of their coast. I then told them that our message was from God, and it was as much to Cochranites as free will Baptist, and that I should rejoice as much to see a Cochranite redeemed from his errors as a free will Baptist. But I told them I had no fellowship with error nor iniquity. They did not request us to hold another meeting, surprisingly. <laughs> but a man three miles from the place was there, a Cochranite, and he invited us to go there, and we gave out an appointment for the next meet evening. Samuel Smith said October 24th, the same day. One man arose and said that there had been a deceiver through that country and had deceived the people, and the people were afraid. And if 
we had fellowship with that people that had been deceived, the Cochranites, he should desire us to depart out of their coast, that the people would not desire to hear us any more. We told him our mission is unto all people, and we did not believe in the doctrine of the Cochranites. Hill was some believing, but rather stupid. Yet we had hopes that he and his family would go to Zion. That's funny. <laughs> well, tell him how it is in his journal. Some hard-headed people, I guess. Yeah. So here's another summary. October 25, 26, Orson and Samuel stay the night at one Simeon Weymouth, a Cochranite. It is house doing service projects, husking corn, laundry, for example, and then they preached in the evenings. That was in, is that Lyman, Maine? Yeah, Lyman, probably. Lyman, Maine. Okay, so then the next day, the 27th of October, Orson, Hyde, and Samuel Smith again are on record of visiting with Timothy Ham. Remember him? The Cochranite. And the Dennett family all day. We're going to talk about the Dennett family in just a moment. Also Cochranites. Yeah, part of them were, there's one guy, um, George Dennett, which we're uncertain of, but we'll get into his, his story gotcha. as, as to why he might be one. Okay, October 28, Orson Hyde. Samuel preached in the spirit. Oh, finally, Samuel's preaching. I thought he was never going to preach. Samuel preached in the spirit. People paid good attention. Maybe oh. he's a better preacher than Orson. And, and some, I think, will go to Zion. Okay, October 30th, two days later. Orson Hyde and Samuel Smith are staying at George Dennett's home. Remember the Dennett family? George Dennett, this is his home that they're staying at. They harvested potatoes during the daytime, and then they preached again at night. Now, George Dennett is disputed whether or not he's a Cochranite. However, upon digging, I realized that a lesser known fact here is that even though people don't have any proof that George Dennett himself practiced the Cochranite faith, however... Um, Jacob Cochran, the founder of the Cochranite movement, was buried in North Saco, Maine, at the farm of George's brother, John Dennett. So George, that we don't know about, George Dennett, we don't know if he is. However, the leader of the Cochranite faith was buried in his brother's farm, John Dennett. So that was shortly after his death. That was March 5th, 1836. So for that reason, a lot of people believe that George Dennett was actually a Cochranite also. Um, however, we don't we don't have hard proof of any of these quotes that he that he participated. In. Yeah, that would just be guilty by association. But um, so it but could be, might not be. Founder of the faith was buried on his brother's farm, so that that's interesting, right? It would definitely make a case for his brother having some close right. tie. So another summary: or November first, Orson Hyde and Samuel Smith visited Simeon Weymouth again and slept at his home that night. So Simeon is a Carcanite, so they slept at his home. In Lyman, Maine. The next day, Orson Hyde and Samuel Smith stayed with George Dennett. Remember Again. Him? And preached at Dennett's daughter's funeral. That seems pretty intimate. Um, at least they, they were good enough friends to invite these, these preachers to come and speak. At her, yeah, at the funeral, which is obviously tragic. So here we go. November 4th, Orson Hyde entry. Went to Methodist meeting in the forenoon, hoping to give out an appointment for evening, but the minister gave out an appointment before me, and we arose disappointed. But I spoke to them about 15 minutes, and we bore strong testimony upon the gathering, in quotes, which sounds like refer reference to Zion. Held a meeting in the evening at Mr. Dennett's, cried against one unclean spirit, and had a very good time and meeting. November 4th, same day, Samuel says in his journal, went to a meeting expecting to give out an appointment for the evening but the preacher gave one out for himself. Darn. We returned to Dennett's and Timothy Ham and others that were in the doctrine called Cochranites, and some of them desired us to come into their quarter and preach. Ham, who's a Cochranite, Ham, Timothy Ham, began to pray as he called it and went into a wonderful spirit of distraction and confusion. Well, this is as he called it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He called that a prayer. Yea, it was an evil spirit, and we bore testimony against this spirit. Stayed overnight at Dennett's. Again, held a meeting in the evening. I, I'm, I'm sad he didn't include how that testimony against that spirit was received. I can't imagine it was wonderfully received. Okay, November 9, Orson Hyde entry. Went up three miles to S. Weymouth's, Simeon Weymouth's again, a Cochranite, and baptized him. Uh and that has bracket George Dennett. So that means they baptized George Dennett and not Simeon Weymouth. Yeah, George Dennett was baptized at that, that day. 
and in the evening had a prayer and a very good time. And the Lord was with us. And Satan also came in. A crazy sort of a female. <laughs> Satan. Okay. We cried against her and after a short time got her still. Tarried or stayed the night at the same place. At Simeon Weymouth's. Okay, so those are the accounts. Now, these are abridged. This isn't the entire diary, but I, I took the ones that were relative to, you know, Cochranism and, and their teachings there. But, you know, a uh, big thanks goes to the, you know, the prices. Um, and, and, you know, we got a lot of their, their references and a lot of their stringing this stuff together. In chapter three of their volume one of Joseph Fought Polygamy, there's a lot more about this that we can't go into on this episode. So if you're interested, we'll put that in the show notes. Go to hemlocknots.com slash three, and you can get a link to read the full chapter there, which is really good. Okay, so this brings up some pretty interesting questions about the Cochranites, right? So we have some highlights here. Yeah, so in this next slide, we're going we're gonna to sort of truncate all of the instances where they slept at people's homes. And there are one, two, three four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, at least 12 nights on record of them staying in members' homes that were uh, Cocker nights. And so we have to ask ourselves, well, did they just meet some wackos at, you know, town square and thought they were a little weird? No, like these people spent months and months very, very closely and intimately related to, to many of these Cocker night families. Right. I mean, we started in July and then we skipped to the end of September. I mean, where were they? Where were they staying? Where were they teaching? Uh, all the way to the beginning of November. So that's a lot of nights. And um, interestingly, these people, like you mentioned, were kind enough to let them in their homes and to stay there and um, likely even feed them uh, in addition to hearing them preach. Yeah. I mean, the Cochranites seemed like pretty decent people. They were nice people as far as being hospitable, right? So they had some strange beliefs according to, you know, these two missionaries. Um, however, you know, we have to realize that this is more, this is ran into some up there. They preached to them and they were hard. No, like there was an entire summer and fall of Cochranite labors and, and Cochranite encounters and Cochranite friendships and speaking at Cochranites, you know, daughter's funerals and all kinds of things, right? So, um, so sleeping with the enemy. So here we have a record, at least nine instances in their journals where they stayed with these cockroaches. Now we went weeks sometimes between entries. There's no mention of where they stayed. I would imagine this is at minimum nine nights, but um, probably several months worth if you added it all up, if I had to guess. Right. And of course, the the title there, tongue in cheek. This is this is not an insinuation of what Samuel Smith and Orson may or may not have been up to. Just to, but just to pointing out, hey, they they did see their lifestyle up close and personal. Uh huh. Absolutely. Yeah, and these probably weren't gigantic, you know, seven thousand square foot mansions. These were probably little cabins. You know, these were it's pretty humble little towns. And so, you know, if there's a man sleeping in his house and he's got two three brides, you know. Um, and then Samuel Smith's in the corner with Orson, you know, like they would have seen probably a lot of the, um, the interactions and, and, and known the, the lifestyle of the Cochranites having multiple wives, you know. Okay, take this one, Dustin. Okay, so on this slide, we're pointing out how many times the reference trying to get people to not only be converted, but to be converted and come, come to Zion. <clears throat> which of course was ultimately going to, going to be established in Missouri, but they're trying to get people also to come to Kirtland uh, first with that ultimate goal of going to gathering together in, in Missouri, in Zion. So look at all these here. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight distinct references. And then the other reference that was less distinct was the gathering reference that I mentioned that Orson had said. So nine, nine references. Yeah, for sure. You know, and, and some people will say, well, you know, there were a lot of Cochranites up there and yes, they taught some of them, but you know, they weren't to blame for what happened in Kirtland and Nauvoo. Well, we're not putting the blame entirely upon them, but the origins of that doctrine and that teaching clearly were from the Cochranites as far as, you know, the first. Or our earliest, re our earliest yeah, record of that doctrine. First records we have that are, that are pretty credible suggest that, you know, they were learning about these doctrines up there, um, up in New England quite a bit. And so, yeah, they, were, they definitely were bringing people to Kirtland at the time. A lot of their converts were told to come to Kirtland, right? Um, 
Let's go, let's go to the next slide and we can explore some of the other connections here. Um, so this is a map of you know New England in the 1830s and you, you see the little area up there. Um, Saco, Maine was the site of three church conferences. June 13th, 1834, there was a conference up there in Saco, Maine. August 21st, the next year, 1835, was the second conference in Saco, Maine. And then August 12th, I'm sorry, August 12th through the 14th of 1836 was the biggest of the three conferences in Saco, Maine, where 52 members of the Saco branch attended. So they had baptized at least 52 people up there, not necessarily Orson Hyde and Samuel Smith, but the missionaries in general had at least 50 people up there in that branch. Um, and then, you know, members of the branch attended, 52 of them, along with Brigham Young and nine of the members of the Quorum of the Twelve. So do we have any clue how many of those 52 might have been former Cochranites? I don't. I know that George Dennett, remember him? He was the guy with the question mark as far as, right. you know. Um, so he was baptized. That was the only one I could find from from these two journals that, uh, besides Augusta Cobb, who who many believe was a Cochranite. Now, she, do you want to tell the story about Augusta Cobb, Dustin, and, and how who she ended up being in church history? So a lot of, a lot of people will point that she was a Cochranite. Now we don't have proof of that, but what we do have are some interesting pieces of evidence regarding um, her involvement later on. So she does end up becoming uh, the first polygamist wife of Brigham Young. And she had had a marriage here in Maine. Uh, uh, Boston. And Bo yeah, sorry, Boston, right? Because that's where they that's where they baptize her in Boston. She'd had a marriage there in a family, and she didn't come with them, but she did come with a new baby named Brigham when she uh, finally traveled. Now she didn't travel at this time. We just read in 1831 that she was baptized. She did not come to Kirtland at this time. In fact, um, it wasn't until she came. What year was it, Mark? I think it was November of 1842, somewhere late 1842. And she joined um, the and Saints in Nauvoo. And Brigham Young did not marry her until um, I think the following summer, 1843. It was a secret marriage, you know, on the down low. So um, when she, you know, when she arrived to Nauvoo, um, she buried a five-month-old baby named Brigham, and she had left her husband. They were a very wealthy family. They had tons of land in Boston. So left her husband of 20 something years and seven children behind to go and meet and to, and to marry Brigham Young later on. And uh, interestingly enough, you know, she was, she was pregnant before she moved down here with a, with a little man named Brigham. And it's a sad story that he died, but you know, um, so whether or not Brigham Young was just highly influential to that family and, and they really liked Brigham. Uh, what's interesting is we didn't even talk about Brigham Young. You know, these, these journals were, were Samuel Smith and Orson Hyde. Now, Brigham Young went up to New England several times. It seemed like at least once a year for a number of years, right? And, and these three conferences here, he attended at least one of them. So he was always going up to Maine and he, he always liked New England and Boston area. And so um, he might've had family up there and, and some other things, but uh, um, yeah. And then, uh, you know, one time, even to the Kirtland High Council, he was going to go on a mission up to New England and to this area in, in Maine and Boston. And um, he requested to the High Council against the commandment of the Lord to travel two by two. He requested that he travel alone. And so there's some question marks there as far as what Brigham Young was involved with when he went up to Maine. And he, he knew Augusta Cobb really well because when she arrived in um, she, when she arrived in Nauvoo later on, um, obviously she had a baby named Brigham and then they were very familiar. You know, they, they hung out a lot. They courted and, you know, spent a lot of time together, raised to my brows. And then there was a, there was a polygamous marriage later on. Right. And, and uh, we will have to have an episode or more on that aspect, but that's a little bit of background here of converts um, and these conferences in this whole area. Okay. So there you have it. This is the topic of the origins of polygamy. And we can't talk about the origins of polygamy diving straight into Fanny Alger. No, we have to go back to 1831, 1832, the greater context of what was happening in the church. And the church, the LDS church has these two journals in their archives. They know about them. They're cataloged. These aren't a surprise to anybody. Why they're not showing up on the church history essays, we don't know. But these are things we need to throw out there because there's a big void. Um, in the LDS church history as far as where this thing started and where it came from. Right. 
any closing remarks or any final things you want to point out? Uh, just, just the biggest takeaways. This is our only firsthand account this early about any mention of polygamy, um, the plurality of wives, spiritual wifery from two different missionaries that were preaching together. Uh, first mention of the baptism of one Augusta Cobb, and she will come in to play significantly later. And she did not travel to Kirtland upon her baptism. She stayed there uh, with her family. And also that, yeah, the, the, the church doesn't mention this, even though they know about it, they have to know about it. These are, these are prominent missionaries, prominent members, they're journals. Um, they've been published in these other places. So it can't, they can't be ignored. And yet, interestingly, they are not included in the uh, gospel topic essays. Right. And I've had a number of conversations over the years and I, I've thrown out these journals as, as, as one more thing to consider to a lot of people. And, uh, you know, it, it's sad that sometimes the reaction is, oh, well, that's just our LDS garbage. You know, that's just that's just their narrative. Like, no, the LDS church owns these, you know, they're in their archives. <laughs> like they, they have these records. They have these journals. They belong to the LDS church. This is not our LDS history. This is everything history, right? And so, not well, and, and to add to that, this whole pursuit of hemlock knots is to look at sources. Doesn't matter who owns the sources. We don't give a crap. Are, do we? are, are the sources that, that are inside the Vatican vault false? Just because I don't believe in Catholicism, that would be ridiculous. Are the are the would the scrolls that would have been found? You know, just the teachings might be true or false, but doesn't mean that the journal entry itself is false. Doesn't mean that the does that make sense? And so we're trying to look. It doesn't matter who owns what manuscripts, um, if it's an actual piece of history, then we got to look at it. Yep. And Samuel Smith and Orson Hyde, we, we focused in on their journals here, but man, there were dozens and dozens of missionaries that went up and served in this area of the country. They had three conferences up there. Remember, nine of the Quorum of the Twelve were up there. They met people. They met these met 52 converts. They preached while they were up there. So let's not pretend that Orson Hyde and Samuel Smith were the only ones that knew about this. I mean, there were probably at least three dozen missionaries that tracked through that land up there. And, you know, they had connections. They had friends that, you know, I'm sure they gave them some recommendations on where to stay and where to sleep and who to meet. And, you know, and, uh, and so we need to take the totality of this. And, and when we look at the origins of polygamy and we start thinking, well, you know, W.W. Phelps letter was the beginning. no. Why don't we back up and take a look at the most credible sources we have from firsthand contemporary accounts of people that were actually there, right? W.W. Phelps, take a seat. You're not there, son. So take a look at the people's writings that were actually there, collaborate them. Are there more than one witnesses? Are they firsthand? Are they contemporary? Those are all green check marks right. on, on the quality indicator. Does it mean that everything they said in those journals is true? No, it just means that the source is a good source to study for this topic. Right, and well, and I also wanna add, you know, as someone who has been a religious missionary, I understand the notion of what you talk about with your fellow buddies. So they get back from this mission and look at all these times they wrote about it in their journals. You think they're not going to talk about all this stuff, like this crazy doctrine that these guys are preaching and, and the way that they live and this, this the plurality of wives and the spiritual wife. I mean, you bet they're going to tell everybody about it. And then two years later, they're like, where should we have a conference? They're like, I know. How, let's go to, <laughs> let's go to Saco. You know, and, and how, and, and very possibly could be uh, appealing to certain people when they hear about it, especially when they hear about the way that they invite people to stay at their homes and to try out their religion. You know, if, if anyone had any, any inkling for um, doing any, you know, misconduct in that, in that regard, in that spiritual that system, they, they could, they, they knew where to find it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and some of these people were, you know, widows and lonely and, you know, some of the prominent people, Brigham Young had lost his first wife and it, there's no, there's no telling, you know, uh, I don't know. These are just questions we have to wrestle with. This just throwing out there. Yeah. Just think, think critically about this stuff. We're not going to tell you what to believe, but we will, if there's missing sources in the timeline, you know, we're going to throw them out there. Right. So, um, so this has been, you know, the first full featured full length episode, you know, polygamy, we're going to cover a lot of topics about this moving forward. Right, Dustin. So, 
Yeah, we got um, a lot of good ones. But, but this has to be the first one. This has to be the foundation because it's the first one. It's the first this source. Is where it starts, right? It builds upon this, you know, this influence, right? And so, anyway, um, Dustin, any closing remarks? Should we wrap it up? Uh, that's it. So we'll we'll come back with more later, and hope to see you soon. Thanks for listening. If you like this show, share it with your people. Join the conversation on Facebook, YouTube, or HemlockKnots.com, where you'll find show notes and source material for these subjects, and much more. <laughs>